right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Dr. Frumi Rachel Barr, who is up in Los Angeles. How are you doing, Dr. Frumi? Just great. It's another uh, sunny day. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, Dr. Frumi has been a strategic advisor to CEO and their teams. You have a passion for guiding leaders to create fabulous culture. You did so with your own company. You're a serial entrepreneur, having started and run five entrepreneurial ventures before starting your current uh, your current uh, company scaling for growth, and so we're going to talk about the we're going to talk about on entrepreneurship in general today because I think sometimes you know people have different ideas of what it is or different expectations and and maybe you know since the pandemic and all the a lot of changes in the world maybe there are more people than ever considering about going out on their own or doing something or being an entrepreneur so um when when you first come to start to think about you know doing something on your own or starting your own business or being an entrepreneur what what are some of the what are some of maybe the questions somebody should ask themselves to make sure that this is the right path for them to go down? Well, the thing they shouldn't do is take their terrific idea and ask their mother if it's a good idea. <laughs> That's right. the first thing not to do. Uh, many people have uh, good ideas and spend a lot of time and money chasing down rabbit holes, hoping which is not a plan, that their idea will work. So I would say anybody considering being an entrepreneur first has to test the viability of their idea. Many years ago, I was an adjunct coach for a small business development center, actually in Irvine. And many people would say to an entrepreneur, oh, that's a terrible idea. Well, when you tell an entrepreneur that an idea is not a good one, they'll just try all the harder to prove that it is. So it's important as an entrepreneur to first really test whether people will buy their idea, whether it's a product or a concept. And then when they're sure that it's a good idea, uh, find their product market fit and then they can start. But they also have to have an entrepreneurial mindset. And that, and that requires a lot of grit, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, completely. And I mean, I guess, yeah, that's the first part is obviously figuring out if you have a product or service that people need or want or prepared to buy, uh, prepared to pay for. And then, as you say, that the second part of it is mindset. And am I prepared? Do I, as you said, do I have the grit to go through the ups and downs of it? Um, do I have enough uh do I have enough money to sustain myself during that period? Um, there's probably a lot of questions you have to ask yourself, but I would say mindset uh, is probably one of the biggest one. And, and what do you think then character, characterizes uh, the mindset of a successful entrepreneur from the rest? I would say entrepreneurs have to be continuous learners. They have to, have to be open to new ideas. They have to find a really good team and then once they find a good team, they have to be open to their team's ideas. So finding really clever people, not worrying so much about what their roles are, that comes later because when you're an entrepreneur, often you have to do everything. And then, uh, so really finding the right people to do it and also really knowing why they are embarking on the journey in the first place. Uh, I, I wrote a book called The CEO's Secret Weapon Mm -hmm. how to accelerate success and uh simon sinek who's very well known for start with why yep. um ted talk wrote the foreword to the book and what i found when i was writing the book i spoke to ceos all over the world everywhere from dublin to sao paulo and and i asked them what their challenges were and the book what the book is about is how to use your why as the engine to overcome your challenges, because there will always be challenges. So if the reason for starting a company is just to make money, that's not a good enough reason. Other shiny objects will come along and you can make money in many ways. But if you want to change the world because you know, you're, let's say, 
uh, creating a park for dogs, an mm -hmm. unusual park for dogs. And right. dogs are your life and you're absolutely passionate about it. In that case, you know, your why might be big enough that whatever comes along, you can sustain yourself during the roller coaster ride because it always is. Mm -hmm. Even when you, you know, what, what I always find amazing, and I've, I've found this even in myself, is that you always think that when you're smart, you're going to do things faster, better, whatever, than everybody else around you, right? But it doesn't work like that. There is a time that it takes to build whatever you're doing, to lay a foundation, to raise money, whatever it is, and it doesn't always happen overnight. Most of the overnight successes we're aware of are like 25 year overnight successes, like Apple, for example, it didn't happen in year one. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things I just wanted to come back to there. I think the first one is the purpose, as you said. Uh, I think that I think it is true. I think a lot of people jump into things without really asking themselves why. Why do I really want to do this? What is the purpose? And I think uh, it's true for entrepreneurs. It's true for anybody who has any kind of job. I think uh, people don't often ask themselves enough. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I getting up every morning? Why am I pouring myself into this? Is this really what I, you know, do I have a passion around this? Is this something I, I care, I care enough about? So when you when you coach uh, um, entrepreneurs or when you coach people coming through, I guess uh, you really have to help them dig into that why, because as you said, the the why is going to be what's going to sustain you when the going gets tough. Right. So the why is the first thing. And then I would say the second thing are your core values. What do you really care about? Because when you're very sure of what your core values is, not just as a word on a page, you know, a list of eight core values, starting with integrity, of course, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's, not, that's not it. It has to go much deeper. There's a wonderful company in Canada uh, called Macintosh Perry, and one of their core values is make mama proud. So I think we know what that means. And of course, even then, they still have a paragraph explaining exactly what they mean by that. And I think uh, no matter who you are, even if you're just alone as an entrepreneur and you want to attract a business partner, you have to know your core values and make sure that you and your partner are in alignment with each other. You don't have to have the same core values, but you have to be in alignment because if they don't fit, it, your partnership's not going to last. And if you don't attract people based on your values, they're not going to stick either. You can have the best sales guy in the world, but if his idea of how to get business is completely out of alignment with how you would do mm -hmm. business, it's your company. You have to protect it, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I love that point about, you know, uh, identifying your core values because again i think you're correct i think the number one is the purpose i don't think enough people figure out the purpose and then i don't think enough people figure out your core values and i think when you reach a certain stage uh your core values should normally would be there would be a finite amount of them like a small amount of really core ones that you that are kind of non-negotiable and again i don't think we often do a great job of defining what those are for ourselves and once you do, you have to keep reinforcing them. So you have to create activities uh, that will keep supporting your core values, especially in today's world when there's so many remote teams. So mm -hmm. if you have a remote team, you might have 15 people on a Zoom call. You have to start off by reinforcing your core values. One of the companies that I'm involved with does this absolutely every Monday. And if you're late to the meeting, you might be called on to share all the core values because you're late. <laughs> right. I hope maybe oh, punctuality is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So those are two of the most important things. But also, we hear a lot uh, about creating a business plan. And every company has to have a business plan, especially if you're going to raise funds. You have to know who your management team is, your market analysis, your co competitive analysis, every last thing. But it doesn't end there. To me, the companies that are the and, and uh, entrepreneurs who are the most successful are the ones who not only have a business plan, but they also have an execution plan, which means that they know exactly 
how they're going to do what they say they want to do. And what that looks like, it incorporates uh, core values, it incorporates purpose, et cetera, brand promise, but it also looks three to five years out to say, this is who we want to be. These are the uh, capabilities that we have to develop, the processes we have to develop to get there. And then that gets broken down uh, from the three to five years to what are we going to do this year? And then more important than that is how, what are the four 12-week uh, year periods? So think of each quarter as a 12-week year. And between each 12 weeks, you have another week to prepare the next 12 weeks. And that way, nothing falls through the cracks. You know what your priorities are based on that 12-week year. And you know who's accountable for which priority. And that way, the, the, the issues that, that coaches are usually called in for are things like uh, the team isn't performing or they're not communicating. Probably communication is the number one reason why coaches are called in. And that can be taken care of just by having a really solid execution plan where you know exactly what the cadence of your meetings are and you know exactly how you're going to communicate. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. And I think that, again, is that where sometimes people fall down and they think the business plan is the end in itself, as you said, and the uh, and then you just put the business plan into operation. But it's but you can't. You need an execution plan. You can't just take a, a business plan as it serves a different serves a different purpose. The other thing that you will that you mentioned earlier, and I think this is one that probably um, derails people more than anything else, and that is that pretty much everything takes longer than you would like it to. And that you have to be prepared for that. And uh, because we can, let's face it, we're very good at being over optimistic or conning ourselves, fooling ourselves, thinking, oh, well, you know, so we'll do this for three months. And then by six months, you know, we'll be break even and then we'll be this. And, you know, it may, may turn out to be two years before your break even or whatever it is. But I, I think underestimating the time frames is something that really often, you know, kills people. And uh, I would say nobody should quit their day job. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a brilliant idea, you can put all these plans into work in the evening, on the weekends, uh, create your website, get everything lined up. And only when you're truly ready do you press the go button. You know, too many people just get, either get angry at work or they get frustrated. <laughs> and, well, I've had enough. I'm going to go start a, you name it, consulting practice, right? And I think the other thing is that people are afraid to invest in themselves, uh, they're, they're ready to invest in their business. They might have a, a runway, let's say, of uh, six, to, six to eight months, and, and they feel, okay, by then I'll be at break even. And they don't want to invest in, in a guide or someone who's done it many times because they're smart. But what they don't realize is they get in their own way. And sometimes having a partner or a guide who can say to you, you know, I think it's time for a pivot. This isn't working. What else can we do? Or you, this idea isn't working at all. Maybe you have to go back right. to the drawing board. Just imagine how much time and energy people could save if they were willing to have someone who could guide them who has experience. Yeah, and that's why I think uh, coaches and people like yourself are so important because, let's face it, uh, you need that third party external person who has no emotional connection or investment and it's not like asking your friend or or, or family member or anything you know because you're you're number one you might get the truth from them but you may not like it because it comes from them um the point is when you work with a coach you're more likely to listen to what they have to say because number one you know you've hired them and second off is that they have no other connection to you other than a business relationship. Also, they're not trying to protect you from yourself. You know, very yeah. often, you know, you have uh, your mother, who might <laughs> say it's a great idea, let's say, I believe in you, you could do anything. But that doesn't mean it's a good idea. Or, or yeah. your friends, on the other hand, tell you not to do it. Because mm -hmm. they're afraid. I remember I had a friend once when, right, I've been a, a business coach for 20 years, but I, I had a very high paying CFO position and I was babysitting 
my two co-founders and I just thought, okay, I can't do this anymore. All <laughs> they care about are the BMWs in the parking lot. And, you know, we have to build a business here. Um, but it's really hard to, to say to your, a friend, I'm leaving this because it's not for me anymore. Now, yeah. had I had a business coach then, I would have prepared myself better. So a lot of what I teach people is really based on my own experience. Because 20 years ago, coaching was just starting. Yep. And now, of course, everybody's a coach and they're not all create, created equal. I, I often find it funny how somebody who's 35 can have 30 years experience, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There was some, there's some amazing five-year-olds out there who, uh, who go on to be amazing coaches. Yeah. <laughs> But it's it, it but it, it's it's a very good point because as you said, I mean, not all coaches are created equal, and I think you have to be just as careful in your choice of of coach. And really, you need somebody who's been there and done it, and and can show the fact that they've been there and done it. Because uh, you know, as you said earlier, somebody giving you good advice is, can save you a lot of time and effort, money and heartache. There was a long time though when I didn't want to even use the word coach because right. I felt it was like so bandied about that. Being a coach wasn't special. And so I had these ideas, you know, of calling myself for many years a CEO confidant. And then I was, uh, you know, a CEO advisor. I tried to use every word except coach. But what I finally learned, and, and which just goes to show it's hardest to look at yourself often, was that people understand what a team coach is. So now when I tell people I'm a team coach, and what that means is, for any company to be successful, the team has to trust each other. They have to be able to engage in healthy conflict so they can make commitments. And if they can do that, then they have to hold each other accountable. And that's how you get results. And it wasn't until I, I started saying that that people started saying, oh, that's what a team coach is. Mm -hmm. You know, most people think of the basketball coaches or the football coaches, but, but teams, in order for them to really uh, be high performance and maximize for a CEO, maximize whatever he pays them. All those are important because if yeah. the CEO that isn't prepared to, to have the team have healthy conflict, they don't get to the really good stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it kind of, it's kind of paradoxical in some ways nowadays, uh, or it's a strange world we live in where, uh, we understand that intellectually, like creative conflict is, is, is where great ideas come from. But we're also trying to create a conflict free work environment as well at the same time. And we're uh, uh, so it's kind of like th things are a little, I would say, confused right now uh, yeah. in some ways. And the people are getting a lot of different advice coming from different people. Well, you know, if you ask uh, people what their decision making process is. They very often look at you like deer in the headlights because they yeah. don't have a process. Everybody knows how to make a decision. You know, it's kind of yes, no, or I need more information. <laughs> but that's not how it goes in a team. Usually it's the loudest voice that gets heard or the guy who pounds on the table and says, this is the problem. But, you know, is it the real problem? And then yeah. once you know what the real problem is, then are you willing to take the time to look at our alternatives and consequences? And that's why it's important to have healthy conflict. Yeah. Unfortunately, the word conflict could mean anything from a war zone to sitting in a, in a conference room, right? So mm. maybe you don't have enough language around it yet. Yeah, I think that's probably uh, that's probably a good point. And it's also, I think it's, uh, you know, different people approach these things in different ways. So sometimes maybe it's good to have this have this uh, have it facilitated again by by a by a third party but uh, but I do think if you have if we're going back to what we started talking about at the beginning if you have the core values and you and you stick by them then the core values should be a safety net for people to be able to have creative conflict because they know it's coming from a place of goodness yeah exactly I would agree so recently, during the pandemic, I spent the last six months creating courses. So my Excellent. courses are for entrepreneurs. So one of them is entrepreneurship and leadership. The second one is people and culture. And the others are strategy, execution, cash management, and data management. 
And those are all areas that an entrepreneur needs to learn in order to, to be successful. One of the mm -hmm. mistakes that entrepreneurs make early in their journey is they might hire their brother-in-law, for example, as their CFO. Yeah. Well, that doesn't work. So uh, it's important to really understand where you're going in terms of if you want to grow or you have potential for high growth. It's important to not to wait till you get there to figure it out. The foundation and the, and the good practices have to be put in place way before you get there. Yeah, so that's, and that's I think teach. Yeah, no, it's fantastic, and uh, and all uh, below this video will be the links to um, to all of the all of those and to your website and all of that, so people can uh, get the latest information. I think the other thing, just uh, for me, just to 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 finish up, you touched on thing there. I think another thing uh, that uh, entrepreneurs or when people starting out, they often make that mistake is around the finances. Is that people think that they're maybe a little bit more financially sophisticated than they are, or as we said earlier, that things take a little bit longer than they than you think they will. And also, we have this very annoying thing of where you can you can sell your product or service, and it looks great. You've got some revenue in, except you haven't got the cash in. So then you run into that thing where you think, well, I've got all this revenue, but then you suddenly run out of cash. Because you've no cash flow, because it's all it hasn't been paid yet. You haven't collected it yet. And cash is oxygen. Yeah. And you need the oxygen to breathe, and you need the cash for your business. Absolutely. So lots of times, uh, I've I've had the opportunity to talk to CEOs who tell me a big secret. They tell me that they don't know how to read their financials. Mm -hmm. Think about all the entrepreneurs who who don't go to business school. They don't have to go to business school necessarily. Yeah. And not saying you must go to business school, but if you don't, then there's a lot of things that you have to learn to make sure that you can run your company. And I've had to teach CEOs how to look at their income statement, how to read their balance sheet, so that they can ask the right questions of the person in their company that's supposed to be doing, taking yeah. care of those things. Because if you don't know the questions to ask, how are you supposed to get the answers? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you don't know what you're looking at. And that's the times when you suddenly get little surprises where you're like, but I thought we were doing so well. And you go, oh, yeah, but there's this over here. And then you go, well, I didn't I didn't know about that. Um, but yeah, I think one of the when I when I first started, um, you know, moving up in companies, I read a book, I think it's called Finance for Non-Financial Managers or something, right. think, Yeah, which is a phenomenal, fan, fantastic book. But yeah, it's one of the best things to learn as you go through is to learn uh, is to learn how to read financial statements, is to learn how to read spreadsheets, how budgets work, how you know cash flow statement, all of those work. Uh, you'll ne you'll never regret learning that. It may not be the most exciting and interesting thing to to learn, but you'll never regret learning it. Right. That's a really good book. And I actually wrote a book summary on that particular book. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. No, it is. I, I got that. It was a great it was a great starting point because uh, at that point it was, uh, yeah, it was early on in the Internet days and all of that sort of stuff. So there wasn't the same amount of material to hand. But uh, but yeah, it, it, absolutely. I, I would totally agree with you on that, on, on, um, on learning about finance. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, even if that's not the part, maybe it's the other part that's more exciting to you, like the selling and the marketing and all of that. But if without the financial acumen, it's going to be a long road. Yes, let's shorten the road. Yeah, let's shorten the road. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fumi. As I said, all of Dr. Fumi's information is going to be below this video, and I would encourage you to check it out. But before we go, please just recap for people what it is you do today. Ah, so I am a course creator, creating courses for entrepreneurs to learn how to streamline and accelerate their success. I'm a business coach and a guide that helps people get there. And That's a team excellent. coach. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I think uh, you've know, been through the pandemic and everything. There's probably a lot more people are considering uh, maybe doing things on their own. So I would uh, absolutely encourage you to go check out um, Scaling for Growth and, and Dr. Froomey's work. Again, thank you. Thank you for listening and watching. Thank you, Dr. Froomey. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.